Welcome, everybody. My name is Nina Jane, and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Ashland, Massachusetts. I'm very happy to be here with Erica Serino, who, am I saying that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, who has written this book called Thicker Than Water. It's all about the plastics in our world. And oh my gosh, she has so much to say. We have so much to learn. But before we get to her, I just want to say a couple things. One, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming. We couldn't do it without them. And also um, Erica, who agreed to let us share this program with uh, local libraries. And we 35 ended up partnering with us. And instead of listing them all, I'll put them in the chat. But, um, you know, when libraries get together, you know that we can make some magic. So here we go. <laughs> making some magic. Um, you can buy Erica's book from Aesop's Fables. I'll put the um, link in the chat, but you can also get it from the library. So, you know, do, do what you do. Just read the book. And um, Erica has a presentation with wonderful pictures that are going to like astound us. And she's going to go through her presentation and we'll take questions after that. So please put your questions in the Q&A. There's a button at the bottom of your screen. Use that, but use the chat for any kind of chat that you're talking, that you want to talk with each other about. So um, I'm going to, Erica is a photographer, a journalist, a uh, warrior, and we're really thrilled to have her here talking about her book, Thicker Than Water because there's so much that we feel like we know about plastics, but there's so much more that we don't know. So Erica, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I cannot wait for this conversation. Thanks, Mina. And thank you to Ashland Public Library and all the other libraries that help support this talk. I'm really delighted to be here um, and share more about my book, Thicker Than Water, and the journey that it took to get into writing it. <laughs> So yes, I'm Erica Serino. I'm a science writer, author, and artist. Um, I am based on Long Island Sound, which is where I've grown up um, and lived the majority of my life. Uh, it's a very special place to me, and I feel very, very connected to it. Um, so this is a little backgrounder, so you know where I'm coming from. Um, as a teenager at age 15, I started to work in wildlife rehabilitation, which means caring for sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife uh, in need of help. And over time, I started noticing um, all the wildlife that came into our clinic, they tended to be injured or um, even unfortunately killed, sickened, um, orphaned because of people. And we often have the best intentions, um, but unfortunately our human world interferes with a lot of the natural rhythms of nature. And um, I started to notice that over time and it was really wearing on me. I felt like I was treating just the symptom of a problem, um, but was growing and growing. And don't get me wrong, I love to rehabilitate. I'm still licensed. I still take care of animals from time to time, but um, it is a difficult and very wearing job when that happens. Um, and being aware of the more than human world uh, from such a young age was really an impactful experience. And it really connected me again with this place of uh, Long Island Sound and the coasts that I inhabited. Um, one of the issues that kept coming up for me with the wildlife um, was plastic pollution. And I think this is an issue that many of us have encountered first at the beach, um, which was definitely my experience. So again, being connected to this place, I really noticed the plastic pollution worsening year after year. And I'm 30 years old. So, you know, even in my lifetime, the amount of plastic on the coastlines has really exponentially increased. Um, and I've known that because I, I go out there and I, you know, enjoy nature as much as I can. And unfortunately, um, noticing this problem only getting worse. And so when I was in college, I switched tracks. I said no more to the wildlife rehabilitation uh, as a professional field, although I love it and I respect it. Um, I want to start bringing attention to these problems. And so uh, right out of grad school, which I studied science journalism, um, because I really want to connect the dots with the environment. Um, our natural world and also traditional knowledge that is known about our world um, and try to enlighten people to the problems before they become worse or before they become problems, hopefully in the first place, um, especially to help our wildlife, but also to help us because we are animals, we're humans, um, but we're also connected to nature and the earth in this very important way, which is we can't live without the earth. So one of my first reporting trips um, in my work as a science writer and science journalist was to go to the Pacific Ocean. And, you know, as I mentioned, you know, many of us have heard about plastic pollution as an ocean issue. And so why not start here? <laughs> um, at the time, 
when I began in the field um, of writing about our planet and our human relationship to the planet, I heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I said, this sounds like an unbelievable place, unbelievably bad place, <laughs> first of all. And I need to see it because I need to document this problem in its entirety and really understand, you know, why is there a floating island of garbage in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? And so I went out there and, and for much of, you know, my journalistic career, save for the pandemic, which really upended a lot of uh, travel for all of us, um, I've always made a point to go out into the field rather than being a journalist who is based in an office, because I feel that the only way to really convey the problem and the solutions um, is to go out into the field and and share what I find and document it all. So I have a background in art. Um, I grew up with my mother as an artist. And so I've always loved photography, drawing, painting. Um, and I see that in addition to my writing as um, interdisciplinary fields. So it's not just about, um, you know, documenting things in a scientific way. It's also a way that we need to understand our values and ethics and how do we relate again to all of the interconnections on the earth and so to go out there and see it makes it a lot easier than just making phone calls to so-called experts and how do you even know who the experts are if you don't <laughs> go out there and see who what they're all about so i headed out into the pacific ocean uh, at age 24 i sailed more than 3,000 nautical miles from los angeles california to hawaii honolulu hawaii and this is just a portion of the garbage patch. And if you read Thicker Than Water, my book, you'll know that this is known as the Eastern North Pacific Gyre. So the North Pacific Ocean being this area of the ocean, and then this is just the Eastern half. A gyre is a circulating ocean current. So it swishes in all of the trash into this area um, into a, a really thick mixture. Don't get me wrong, there's plastic in all of the oceans, but these places are very, very highly concentrated with plastic and other debris. My home for 24 days was SY Christian Schaben. This is a Danish owned boat. Um, it was a pleasure vessel turned to a research vessel. Basically, she's a very old and rusty ship, um, but definitely has a lot of character. And I joined eight others on this trip. You'll see mostly Danes. Um, mostly from Copenhagen. And then on the far right side is Chris Jordan, who's an American artist and photographer. And he documents uh, the impacts of mass consumption on the world and on humanity um, in, in a lot of his work. He's very well known, and I'll show an image later for his series on albatrosses, which are these magnificent seabirds who unfortunately are often the victims of plastic pollution. First thing I learned about the garbage patch, it is not a patch. <laughs> So that was a big surprise. Um, I went out there and there was mostly clean blue sea. It was an absolutely stunning place. And it was a very interesting trip because we lost our engine like five days in. And that was very concerning <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But we ran over a rope and it was our own rope and it was a big mistake. But we were doing research and it was in the middle of the night and the engine went. Um, so we're out there. We're just under sail. It's, you know, calm conditions out there in the in the gyre call it um, like there's a lot of lulls in the weather so it's it's not too um, violent it had been really a lot of wind and waves uh, heading out from Los Angeles and uh, it was very pleasant to be actually in this place um, and so instead it really resembled a soup of plastic stuff and it was a lot of fishing gear but it was also a lot of everyday items so you know what pirate uses a pink dustpan right like <laughs> there's a piece of a, a tv container there was all different types of um, shampoo bottles and foam and rope and all different stuff. Um, and we tried to scoop it out of the water as we could, but this was not a cleanup mission. This was a mission to understand what is going on in this place. So the Danish sailors and scientists I um, was with on this journey, we were doing all different types of research. Um, one of them was to document the plastic in the water. So we found, for example, this was, this is called a ghost net. Um, it's a tangle of all different types of fishing gear. So it's ropes, nets, traps, um, lines, you know, all different things that might have been lost or discarded at sea. Um, it is not good to just toss trash in the ocean, as we know, um, but a lot of fishing vessels, unfortunately, do that. And also um, industrial fishing vessels lose a lot of equipment because it is so massive and it can get tangled, it can get lost um, in violent sea conditions. And so a ghost net is named ghost net because it keeps, unfortunately, catching and killing 
wildlife uh, long after it's been um, just sent out into the sea. So this is a deadly item. It these kind of um, nets kill you know thousands and thousands of marine animals every year. A lot of whales, dolphins, uh, sea turtles, animals that are getting entangled in this. And um, unfortunately, you know, many die. And then those who do survive are either left with the remnants of um, these ghost nets on their bodies or the scars or even the psychological impacts um, of having been entangled. So I met with a researcher um, early on in, in my research, and she was telling me a lot about um, how wildlife are actually acting really anxious and really kind of are traumatized by these experiences. And that was very concerning to me, too, thinking that you know, we have to do something about this in terms of the survival of these creatures because they're actually acting in ways that will impair their survival even more. So that was very strange, but um, important to know. Beyond these larger plastic items, we have this issue with plastic. So basically all the plastic around us, and I'll show you this more in depth in another slide, but every plastic item from the cell phone that you have to your furniture, the paint on your walls of your house, um, all the plastic around us is not kind of static. It's breaking up rather than breaking down. So if we had a wooden house over time, it would start to rot and deteriorate. You know, it could take a very long time um, or a very short time, depending on the conditions. But with wind, water, and waves in the ocean, plastic breaks apart very fast. And especially when it's exposed to sunlight. So a plastic on the surface of the water is breaking up rapidly. Um, and this is what we call microplastic. And many of you, I'm sure, have heard of microplastic. It's in the news a lot lately. It's very scary, but they're finding it in our bodies. Um, and it's long been found in the bodies of wildlife since the 1970s. Um, so it's very concerning that we're finding it. But it's also not just on the surface of the water. We found in our research microplastic on the seafloor, uh, you know, all the way from the water column, through the water column to the seafloor. So that's the gist of it. Um, our research was actually the first research in the Pacific to go below the surface um, in this specific area of the um, garbage patch. So we went from the surface 20 meters down and then 200 meters down um, using these different types of sampling equipment. And there was, unfortunately, microplastic um, and even smaller plastic particles, which we did not have the ability to accurately count and see, but these are called nanoplastics, um, all throughout the water. So these very grim looking Danish scientists are showing you plastic never breaks down. It only breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces because these sieves have different diameters of the, of the uh, webbing inside. So again, just showing you how this actually happens. Another problem with plastic is that it's very toxic and um, it surrounds us. So that's sometimes very um, unpleasant thing to swallow, no pun intended, but we have to understand that um, plastic is made out of fossil fuels and fossil fuels can be refined into petrochemicals and the petrochemicals are ultimately what we use to turn into plastic um, and all the additives that are included in plastic. So these are all different mixes um, and we're seeing that it's affecting life in the oceans uh, on the microbial level. So in this image, you'll see this kind of screen device. And we were taking samples of the ocean water to understand the impacts on surface level organisms. And these organisms are very important. You know, like plankton um, can be impacted by the smallest pieces of plastic because again, it's just breaking up into ever smaller pieces. And we did a lot of similar research on this journey, but another impact of sailing with an all-female crew was to understand how does plastic impact um, the female body specifically? And I learned that because our hormones are so important for our bodies to function normally, and plastic is something that contains a lot of hormone-disrupting chemicals, um, and women being uh, typical reproducers in our society, you know, we can pass on um, all the negative things from plastic, all the chemicals um, to our children when we reproduce. And a lot of these chemicals are being found in breast milk, for example. Plastic particles have been found in human placentas um, on both the maternal and fetal side. So this is a really concerning issue for our survival as a species. Um, a lot of these chemicals, it's not just women that have been impacted, but a lot of these chemicals also have been shown to diminish uh, male sperm count. So Again, it's like plastic is bad on 
so many levels and we're just learning we're we'd scratched the surface for decades and decades um, since plastic was first mass produced. This image is just showing you what's happening to our oceans. Uh, this is a bunch of microplastic and it's not just static. So it's not just in the oceans, as I mentioned, um, but again, learning this early on, I was immersed in it, um, in the garbage patch, but the earth itself is moving all these elements um, around us all the time. So in from the oceans, water evaporates, but what else evaporates with water? Well, plastics. That's why we have plastic in our rain, in our sky, um, in the clouds. It's, you know, constantly moving. So the earth is not a stagnant place and the oceans are not just this dump as, a, as we had been told or had been um, led to think from a lot of the media coverage early on. And that was something I really wanted to do in my journalism was to break through a lot of this misinformation, however, you know, well-intentioned it was, because I think it is shocking to think that our oceans are filled with the remnants of all the stuff that we buy and use every day, you know? This is a fish egg. Um, so just remember what microplastic looks like and then what a fish egg looks like. And so again, with my wildlife rehabilitation background, I'm very interested in what's happening to the more than humans in our world. So these are the wild creatures, um, the elements that we consider non-living like waterways, our skies, um, the soils. And so from birds like a cormorant to dolphins, sea turtles, um, all of these creatures are eating plastic. It's really, as one scientist put it, there's a size of plastic for everyone out there. You know, the smallest plankton, the biggest blue whale, um, they are all consuming plastic, unfortunately. And also, so are we. So just again, underscoring this very important fact, um, something to keep in mind when we make choices in our everyday lives too, of like, why should we avoid plastic? It's a very, there's very good reasons for it. But beyond the oceans, when I returned to land, returned um, <laughs> to Denmark, actually, um, I followed my sailor friends because I wanted to learn um, really where does plastic come from? Like, what were we finding in the oceans? Like, how did it get there? Uh, that was my question. You know, if it's illegal to dump in the oceans. We know that's been happening for many decades, unfortunately, but um, there's a lot of rules against that now. It still happens, um, but you know, what toxic chemicals also does it contain? And so we went through all these samples. I joined uh, Christian who was on the boat and also our captain Torsten joined us as well. And we did a lot of research and we found that there was a whole mixture, you know, there was films and hard plastic, um, there was foam. So all different items that were, um, you know, using our everyday lives were breaking up into these particles in the ocean and we could kind of trace them back, which was very interesting. Um, from the ocean, I wanted to understand, okay, now what's happening in freshwater systems? Because a lot of freshwater systems just simply lead to the ocean. Um, ultimately, they all do by different interconnected uh, pathways. And so I met with uh, Sam Mason, Dr. Sam Mason, who's at SUNY Fredonia. I'm oh, sorry, now she's at Penn State, but she was at SUNY Fredonia in this image. Um, just gonna close my window, it's raining. So um, I learned more about the impacts of plastics on the Great Lakes ecosystems from her specifically. Um, and she was studying the impacts in the sediment. So a lot of the research, as you saw, was focused on the surface of the water. And again, it was the first time in 2016 that we really looked deep into the water in the Pacific, but unfortunately, so much is happening in the sediment as well, and it tends to be ignored because it's less accessible, less accessible to humans, but also our equipment, it can be very difficult to get samples, you know, very deep in the water. So she actually got our hands on a lot of sediment from the Great Lakes, and unfortunately, we were learning that a lot of the wildlife down there, which are really important for the cycles of nutrients and carbon um, in these waterways and water systems are being imperiled because of these tiny pieces of plastic. Um, and so again, I was kind of tracing my way from the ocean to the freshwater and ultimately um, learning, you know, it's so many items, um, car tires, like that was something I never thought of in the garbage patch that was, you know, a source of microplastic in our lives. And um, this is, um, you know, again, the Great Lakes is water systems and knowing that all the highways and parkways and um, every day when we use our vehicles, when we put on the brakes, when we make a sharp turn, it's always wearing away. Um, and so that is in our air and in our water and in our bodies. 
So this was some of the research that I looked at on the right side and then an article I had written on the left side. Um, but really learning again about all these interconnections. So the water, the air, the soils, our bodies. Um, and being in Denmark for a time, I did a, a guest research ship there for a few years and learning from scientists that, you know, we have all these interesting uh, ways to study plastics, but it was almost like the inevitable was delayed. So this was in 2017 when I first learned, oh, maybe we're breathing in plastics. Lo and behold, just last year, you know, plastic was found in real human lungs for the first time. Um, there's been a lot of delays to really understanding that fact. Um, a lot of it is based in just the way that research on humans goes, and there are delays in um, getting, you know, the right ethical uh, strategies to study this stuff, because it is really sticky and it's very unpleasant. Um, but this is the fact, you know, we eat, breathe, drink, and absorb these pieces of plastic into our body. It's very upsetting, and um, I hold space for just absorbing that um, right now. And knowing that we're living in an unbelievable time, you know, the climate crisis is well upon us. Um, the plasticine is also upon us, but we really have to start seeing these and many other human-made crises as interlinked. Um, we have you know, the most inequality in the world that we've ever had right now. We have, um, you know, extreme weather, warming temperatures, pollution everywhere, and it's, you know, plastic pollution, but plastic also contains 13,000 13, and more um, different chemicals. And to know that, you know, this landscape that we've been given is just so now um, polluted by our own doing is really upsetting and concerning. Um, so we need to chart a path forward. I promise the rest of this presentation will not be depressing. <laughs> we're getting to, we're getting to the solutions um, eventually. So hold tight for now. Um, I like to also know that like you know it did only really begin let's say a hundred years ago. So the 1930s, 40s, um, plastic production was ramped up uh, following World War II because a lot of plastic was used in the war effort and petrochemicals um, were really expanded and researched at that time, again, for purposes of war. But then after the war, all of these big factories that were used for making tanks and munitions and other equipment were really converted to uh, mass consumer items. So, you know, big agriculture, big oil, big gas, big plastic, um, lots of pesticides and different chemicals, DDT being, you know, one of these uh, very negative but well-known infamous chemicals um, in our lives and many of our parents and grandparents remember these times and at first plastic was really celebrated it was this unbelievable convenience it was going to make our lives great and uh, all we had to do was clean it up at the end um, but there's no good place to put plastic and again it's never going away um, it's just breaking up into these plastic particles but we have to remember too, we were always, you know, as humans, we always generated waste. I've looked at a lot of uh, anthropological and um, paleontological studies, and it's known that like we, as humans, we made waste piles in ancient times, but that was like items that were uh, made of ceramic primarily or animal bone, different types of cloth that were thrown away. But we really repaired things at a much higher rate. We wasted less. There was a lot more refill and reuse of materials. And that's really what we're seeing now, just as a teaser of um, what we need to do again. Um, so like listening to past generations and um, traditional knowledge of how do we treat the world and each other, because um, mass consumption is not solving our problems anytime soon. So again, these are really important problems to address at this time. And I mentioned inequality, but the injustice of fossil fuels and plastic pollution are immense. Um, predominantly these really, really toxic sites, very dangerous sites. I'm not sure many of you may have seen in the news the huge explosion at um, Marathon Oil Refinery um, in Louisiana recently. And I went down there in 2020 to understand, now that I had traced plastic back to land in my mind and my research, um, really see where plastic is produced and understand the massive injustice that's caused. So um, primarily rural, low-income, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities are forced to live next to these monstrosities of uh, refineries. And these are thousands of acres big. 
And often fossil fuels are processed in the same places where plastics are produced because they are interconnected. Um, and to understand too that whole communities and in many parts of the world, I went to Louisiana because I'm in the US, um, but many parts of the world face this problem. And again, the inequity is in similar communities. Um, in Louisiana, I visited Diamond. It's a small, it was a small African-American community next to the Norco refinery that you saw on the previous slide. Um, and so this area is part of what's known as Cancer Alley, which is an 85 mile stretch between New Orleans and Baton Rouge um, along the Mississippi, both banks. And it's covered by hundreds of industrial facilities, many of which process um, petrochemicals, fossil fuels, and plastics. So again, I mentioned that there's lots of dangerous explosions. This town of Diamond was rocked by several lethal explosions. Um, and by the 1990s, um, relocations were underway in the works um, and, and people had to be bought out because it was so dangerous to live there. It's also super toxic. So people still live in these communities and you know they didn't choose, the, the residents of these communities didn't choose for these toxic factories like Denka's um, neoprene factory, which emits chloroprene gas, very, very toxic and carcinogenic or cancer causing gas, um, or being next to again, like a possible giant explosion that could level your, your house or your town even. Um, so a lot of people are now understanding that environmental justice is part of this huge injustice of, you know, the exploitation of our earth and people as well. Um, and a lot of faith-based community groups have emerged um, in Cancer Alley. And Sharon Levine is a Goldman Environment Prize winner who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, while I was in Louisiana. And to hear from someone who's living next to a facility so close, you know, hundreds of feet away um, is really shocking because I think being down there just for a week was not even enough to understand this experience. And I've lived next to an Asheville and an incinerator in my younger years. Um, I wasn't old enough to understand what was really going on. But um, if you're faced with problem after problem, you know, it's not just, you know, your, all of your neighbors and yourself might be suffering health problems, your friends and family, um, but your house value goes down. Uh, suddenly, you know, industry is replacing your local, um, centers of worship or, or where you would go out to dinner, there were restaurants, or um, even I saw, unfortunately, a whole grave site um, enclosed by a industrial facility. Um, and a lot of this is based on plantation ground. So it's the legacy of slavery is continuing in another way, especially in this region where there's a lot of African-American communities. Um, on Long Island, where I'm from, I've worked a lot with um, an indigenous and African-American community in North Bellport. Um, this is the Brookhaven landfill. As you can see, it's a very large landfill. Of, um, it's 300 feet high. That's you know almost as high as the Statue of Liberty in some areas. Um, and this is a landfill that has been covered with ash as well. So there's a law on Long Island that dictated that there can be no more municipal waste, which is like household waste, First, it has to be turned to ash, which they argue is less toxic. I argue is just con more concentrated. So there's been a big battle over this landfill for decades and decades. And one of the biggest things that I learned about environmental justice um, and unknowingly living in an environmental justice community myself when I was younger is just people in these communities have been speaking out for decades and decades, but because of racism, classism, um, they've, their voices have been suppressed and um, shut down and their representatives, unfortunately, have been choosing profits over their people uh, for a very, very long time. And so this is an ongoing battle. I just learned recently that the town of Brookhaven has extended the life of this landfill or plans to do so, um, which is, again, burdening this community. And all of this trash and ash um, is contaminating local water sources. And Long Island has a a sole, surf, a sole source aquifer, um, which means that once it's contaminated, it is extremely hard, if not impossible, to ever remediate. Um, so this is a real problem, ongoing problem. Um, we can't live without water. And 
as being someone who's from Long Island and the sound being a very important place to me, yes, it's salt water, but it is the water that we need to survive um, as well, because it's, again, all these systems are interconnected and sailing and seeing the rest of the world um, facing similar problems is just really heartbreaking. And I think that urgent action is definitely needed, but I think people know that. I think we feel that we want that. Um, we just don't know necessarily how to get there <laughs> because we've been taught all the wrong things. It's not our fault necessarily, but we do need to find a way to come together um, and solve these problems. And personally, I was really, really inspired by sailing. Um, I had never been out at sea before I was 24. I, I had a little tiny laser sailboat when I was a kid that I would mess around with in the in Long Island Sound and go kayaking and go swimming, but never had I been on a sailboat for that long. And to be out in the middle of the ocean, I can only describe as the most beautiful place I've ever seen in the world. Like it is just unbelievable. Um, the sunrises, the sunsets, the rhythms of the earth out there. And, you know, you lose track of time um, other than, you know, the cycles of the day. Life was super simple. I, again, I mentioned this was a very uh, simple boat. <laughs> so we had to pump the ground for water. We had like these um, step pumps uh, to get different types of water and we would try to save fresh water by also using salt water. Um, so a lot of our bread and our food was made with the same water that we were finding plastic in, by the way, which I know people always say, why would you do that? But um, when you're in this kind of condition, you have more than three weeks at sea, potentially even more when we knew that we had uh, lost our engine, uh, we really had to conserve and be um, wise with what, what you used up. We did not have a functioning toilet. That was a whole other situation. <laughs> Um, and so we had the toilet bucket and I put this in as a very humbling slide because I think when you go out on a sailboat, just lower your expectations for comfort and you'll be okay. <laughs> so um, very comically, we had to make do with what we had. We had very few types of navigation equipment on the boat that was high tech. Um, we had the basics and we didn't have, you know, internet or cell phone service. We often just used paper maps, um, just standard equipment. And we made our way, also relying on the stars as I had written in that slide, but that was a very nice thing to do too, was just to look out the horizon and stay, steering the ship. Um, and so we had everyone on the boat um, so it's nine of us, we had pairs and we would go, pair up for um, two, four hour sailing ships a day. So it's basically like working an eight hour day, but you're in two different shifts. It could be 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, and then 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then every fourth day you would join your buddy and then you would make food for the boat. It's a beautifully bland meal <laughs> of pasta and cabbage um, is one of the delightful dishes we had. And it's so funny because it, the food tastes amazing out there, even if it's uh, from a can or a box. And uh, we did try to minimize our uh, package products, again, being this kind of conscious boat journey um, where we're trying to look at plastic pollution in the ocean. We were careful when we were provisioning the ship. Um, it was not very easy in some situations because, you know, going into port, you don't know what you're going to find. Um, we would wash our dishes with uh, bio benign soap in seawater. And just the most beautiful thing I think about being out there besides all the simplicity was just slowing down so much that we were able to really understand that everyone on the boat, we didn't know each other and we were there because we had the same goals, but also the same values. And we cared about the earth together and we all were on different steps of our journey of getting there and we all wanted to help in some way. And I think that was a really beautiful thing um, I really enjoyed that a lot. And this is, again, the all-female expedition. There was a lot of sisterhood there, which was a really nice thing. And um, yeah, we made it. That trip was across the Atlantic. I don't think I mentioned that, but that was, um, my goal was to see, you know, I saw the Pacific Ocean, what's going on in the Atlantic. And um, sadly, plastic is present. So all of this said, I'm getting to the, the important part, the solutions. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand here, um, you know, where are we with our values as a society? Um, I often think, you know, do we need all of this stuff? You know, this is just in a local park in Long Island. Um, I saw all this plastic. So 
what do we want? <laughs> That's the question. Um, and what do we need really is an earth that supports healthy and long lives and uh, harmony within, you know, the system that we have been given. Um, we need to respect nature. And I think that preserving um, this beautiful place that we have been granted is just um, a very important thing. So we're getting to the point where we need to shift our culture. And um, that's a hard one, I think, because again, we've been taught the wrong things. You saw those ads for plastic. Um, we've been really told that speed and convenience is important, but slowing down. And again, this was, again, the, I mean, main takeaway from sailing, but like really slowing down <laughs> and, and maybe not getting everything you want. Like we couldn't just stop at Starbucks while we were out <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. It was probably like 25 minutes to 30 minutes uh, to make coffee on the tiny gimbaled gas stove that like if it moved the wrong way you're gonna get splashed with hot water and being careful and then the whole trip was um, just a test of patience I think for everyone but we all came off of it much better um, but we can apply that to our lives on land I think as well and just um, really think about what we're doing so taking individual actions is the easiest step some of these take not much more time than plastic. So don't think that you're gonna be waiting <laughs> as I did um, for coffee for you know half an hour on a boat. You can make it at home yourself uh, quite easily with different types of you know glass or uh, pour over. Um, I mean, my coffee setup right now is with a burr grinder. It's a metal little grinder and every morning I have to work for my coffee. Um, but all these items are just simple. A lot of them are free. So I also save a lot of uh, glass jars I get from the grocery store. If I buy jam, for example, that maybe I'm not making that home. Um, and you can use it to store other food or you can use it to put fresh flowers in or your dog treats or whatever. Um, just being more resourceful, I think, is a really key part of minimizing our impact. And it's not just single use plastic, although that is the big one that we should work to reduce, but it's single use everything. Um, and I, I'm often asked, you know, why don't you put like bioplastics in this presentation? And I say, well, wh why would you just replace one throwaway item with another? Um, in some cases we might have to, or um, not have to, but we might be hard pressed to find an alternative. And I think there might be a space for that. And I'll mention a few items later on that could help us. Um, but yeah, using less is really important because all of these items, I want to point this out, still have an impact. There's still a big impact of making a stainless steel um, thermos or a glass jar or bamboo cutlery. But if we keep that thing for as long as we can, it may not be forever, but hopefully as long as we can, um, our impact will be reduced. And many of us, like I mentioned, may have all of this stuff in our houses already. So that's where we can start. <laughs> and I always encourage individual action and don't think that, you know, the problem is enormous, but I don't ever think that anything you do um, is not enough. I think everything adds up for sure. Um, cleanups are not the answer right now, although we should do them as we can um, and help our wildlife thrive. Um, we can definitely keep a lot of these items out of harm's way. Um, but joining cleanups, I learned that we really just stop the problem at the source. And so that's why I'm saying that we need to, you know, they're not the solution, but they are part of the solution. And I think a lot of people do feel inspired after joining a cleanup. And whether it's your own neighborhood or your favorite beach, um, it's definitely always, I think, important to interact with our environment. And if you do see plastic, please do try to pick it up. Um, very disappointing thing. And again, going to the source here. Recycling is not the answer, very sadly. Although we've been told this for a very long time, uh, most plastic is never recycled. And unfortunately, when it is recycled, it is often just downcycled. So think about plastic bags. There's um, you know, so many different types of film bags that you know have been claimed to be recyclable, but maybe they're turned into um, plastic decking for your house, or they're turned into a park bench or you know a fleece jacket with plastic bottles. This is not a good use of plastic because why? It's just reintroducing the toxic poisons back into our lives over and over again. Um, it's not a circular use. That's often a term that's been kind of co-opted or um, taken by the industries making this stuff. You know, plastic was only made to be disposed of. It was not made, excuse me, made to be recycled. And so um, 
a lot of these anti-littering and recycling campaigns have really blamed us as people who consume because we're in the system that we've been told to consume or we you know get ahead um and so we really have to think about it as um these industries that's it's their fault it's their problem and they've created the problem um again with misinformation you know don't litter um you can just recycle it so what does that really mean well just put it in a can and then we'll make more plastic and we'll not do anything with it um Unfortunately, with legislation, you know, a lot of um, states, municipalities, even whole countries have gotten savvier about we need to ban certain types of plastic. But this is also kind of a downstream approach. So, again, source versus, you know, dealing with um, the public. But, you know, banning plastic bags, for example, it if, if you're doing it bit by bit, you know, it's still going to be causing a problem elsewhere and in this interconnected system. Um, it's not going to solve the problem. A lot of states have also preempted plastic bans because plastic and petrochemical industries have huge lobbying power. They have a lot of money and they have a lot of sway in laws that get passed. Um, and so we really need a specific and enforceable um, global approach. On the right side of this page, you'll see a lot of um, industry trade groups. And these trade groups are those lobbyists that I've mentioned um, they are finally the companies that are part of these groups, which include, you know, the name brands we know, um, are being called out. And Greenpeace has done a lot of work in this realm, and I want to shout them out um, for exposing a lot of these members of these groups. Because, you know, brands might say one thing, oh, we're going green, or we're reducing, or we're using recycled plastic. But in reality, the groups they belong to are advocating for these laws that would tamp down on plastics um, to not be passed or to be prevented. So very important to understand these interconnected systems and know that it's way bigger than just, you know, oh, I don't want a straw today. Um, these principles can really guide us. And I think on an individual level, for sure, right? We can all apply this to our lives. And I think that's the most accessible thing to do. Um, but then getting businesses and institutions and then ultimately those big systems to change is the real key here. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, if you are choosing single use, and this is kind of a transition time where I think a lot of people, we might need training wheels, some of us, um, although I, I do encourage you try to go cold turkey with plastic <laughs> as much as you can, single use plastic, um, but choosing truly non-toxic and renewable materials that are as altered as little as possible. Um, and so we have different types of bamboo and different types of wood. Again, not perfect because we are taking from the earth in that way, but better than plastic because they will biodegrade. Seaweed and algae um, have a lot of promise as a material as do uh, hemp and different fibers. And then of course, mushrooms and mycelium um, can be made into a lot of packaging materials. So I work now with Plastic Pollution Coalition. We are a coalition of individuals, businesses, organizations, and other groups that are interested in solving this problem. Um, we have a lot of members who do create you know, reusable, refillable products, but also um, are focused on these other materials, which are interesting to me. Um, if we want effective legislation, one of the most promising things that are on the table right now um, is the UN mandated global plastics treaty that would, if done right, which is very big if, because the industry lobby is in full force um, trying to prevent the right kind of legislation or uh, treaty from being passed um, are all of these different factors. So we really need to, again, focus on that corporate responsibility and then also seeking out environmental justice and justice and reparations for those communities that have been harmed for decades and decades. Um, remediating our environment is critical because we're all finding every day, you know, news headlines and studies coming out with, you know, this chemical in our bloodstream or plastic particles in this part of our body. And the effects are, are significant. Um, in wildlife, we know that, you know, these particles of plastic are carrying poisons that are deadly. Uh, one scientists refer to them as little poison pills. And I think that that is a really good analogy for what microplastic is. Um, we need regulation and enforcement. So it's great to have laws, but <laughs> if they're not regu regulated and enforced, um, you know, companies are not held accountable for their pollution. What does it really mean? 
Um, and then we need to ultimately uh, divest in the fossil fuels and that we use every day and turn off the tap on single use plastics immediately, which is possible. Um, again, reiterating the justice aspect of this, um, there's been a lot of harm done to frontline communities and uh, it's very important to remember that. Watch out for false solutions. <laughs> So false solutions include any type of greenwashed item and greenwashing is basically making something like recycling. Um, sounds good, but is it really great? You have to look deeply at what you're buying. And that's why, again, with bioplastics, I think a lot of these plastics, uh, lately it's been in news headlines that bioplastic straws or even paper straws can be coated with the same toxic chemicals that are in plastic um, or even different toxic chemicals. Right now, PFAS um, are in the news a lot lately. These are water repellent. Um, they often extend the life of different products um, when they're exposed to the elements or water or foods. Um, they're in a lot of food packaging, unfortunately. And so again, just the more natural and reusable you can go, the better um, and avoiding kind of newfangled like greenwashed items. It's very very important. And then, yeah, I mean, this is just what I need to tell everyone because uh, in my journey, I learned this and I think it's been uh, very eye-opening and I'm very grateful for learning this, but um, to dive below the surface because, you know, what we hear and see is not always as simple as it might seem on the surface. And um, to know kind of as an analogy to the plastic problem, like we had just seen the garbage patch in the news as this island of trash and then diving in it was much much different um and so that is what i will leave you with and i hope i feel i've left you feeling encouraged uh rather than doomed um but yeah you're in good company if you want to be a part of solutions and i definitely encourage you to visit the website of uh, my organization um it's a group of great people i was so delighted to join um and we have a lot of members. Please join us a member if you'd like to. We have amazing webinars. Actually, tomorrow we have a webinar at, I think it's at 5 p.m. And it's about U.S. plastic policy, if you're interested. And we'll have a few really inspiring people um, speaking. So thanks for all the love with all those emojis. <laughs> I love it. Um, and yeah, I would love to take questions. I know that we only have about 12 minutes, but um, on the website, you can reach out to me with emails too. So thank you. I'll leave it to Mina now. All right. Thank you, Erica. That was great. Um, yeah, we're we're going to go till eight, but um, you can reach out to Erica afterwards. Um, I had a quick question from our environmental book club. As I said, they they read your book and they said in, in the book, you said EPA level set, keep keeping in mind the average young adult white male. What does that mean? So a lot of um medical research or like scientific research on impacts on humans have put like a 150 pound, like 35 year old white male as the, forget the terminology now, because it's, I need more coffee. <laughs> um, but there's like a, a model, like patient, we'll put, put, say that term. Um, but basically like using that as the basis. So a lot of, um, you know, women, or if you're a different height or weight or, um, gender, I mean, or race, like you're not going to be included in the real impacts of these uh, chemicals or plastics. It's it's only a focus on this one like model person. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I had a question from uh, by email earlier today. One question is recycling plastic in the form of fabric for clothing. Is that a reasonable solution or should we really just move away from plastic altogether? I mean, ideally we would move away. Um, I just did a research paper on uh, plastic and construction materials. And some of that was um, nylon, like from clothing. And to know that, like, just again, repurposing it is just reintroducing the toxins. So especially on your clothes, because um, there was a study recently that, you know, there's BPA in, in elastic sports bras, and you don't want that, you know, especially as a female, like on your body, um, breast cancer rates are rising. And I think we really are seeing connection with these chemicals and cancers of all of all kinds and all genders of people. But yeah, I would avoid um, clothing made out of plastic. I try to do it too, for sure. I purged a few years ago. I'm like, try to only get cotton if you can or other, you know, fabrics that are made of plants. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned um, that the plastic in the ocean isn't exactly what we've been seeing, like these big garbage patches. But um, 
Let's see. Somebody asked very early on, are, is, is, how, does, how does the majority of garbage get to certain places and why does it seem to collect around you know, poorer countries? Is that even a thing? I mean, it seems like it's more arbitrary than that. So glad you mentioned this. I think I failed to mention my presentation, but um, there's so much to get in here in an hour. But um, yeah, so plastic rolls, blows, it flows from freshwater systems. Um, it is dumped in the water as well. Animals actually transport plastics, not to a huge degree, but they do. And of course we do. We drop them on beaches um, carelessly sometimes and hopefully getting better about that. But the reason why there's so much plastic accumulating in developing nations um, is actually this horrible system of waste colonialism where richer countries export the majority of their trash to uh, lower income countries in exchange for money. So mm -hmm. the country and the people that are dealing in trash usually with the governments are making money. Um, and sadly, you know, a lot of this trash is being dumped in the backyards of everyday people, right? And I, in my book, I included um, some cases from Turkey where um, people I connected with, you know, you're waking up the next day and suddenly there's a big burning pile of garbage in your backyard. And it's really um, a scary prospect. And a lot of these countries, um, this trash was exported under the guise of recycling. So, oh, we're going to recycle it in Malaysia or Thailand. And it's simply dumped. And it's not that, you know, people in Thailand or um, Malaysia are making more trash. They're actually the U.S. is the most plastic polluting country in the world. We're also the biggest consumers. Um, but yeah, it's it's not like, I hate when it's blamed on um, global South countries because it's really our faults in the global North of creating all this stuff. So yeah, that's, that's the reason why. That's curious because um, it seems like in America, people are becoming more aware of this and trying to, in, on you know, an individual level, trying to cut down and that, uh, other countries that have very large populations are rising in their uh, plastic use. Have you seen or heard about that? For sure. And like I did go to Thailand. Some of these images were from Thailand. Um, and to learn that, you know, just 20 years ago, there was not a lot of single use plastic at all. Um, food was wrapped mostly in banana leaves. Like it was not normal to get a takeout bag. And now it's everywhere because we are pressuring other countries with this stuff. And it's like, you know, do you want to be part of the capitalist consumer society that we're a part of? And um, traditional ways of doing things are really going by the wayside just so people can tread water and keep up. Um, and again, with all this plastic exported, um, some people are just making use of it. It's like, okay, well, there's a giant tarp dumped in my backyard. I'll use it for my roof because I'm in a low income country and that's, you know, what I can do now. But um, engaging with, you know, supporting those traditional ways of doing things and, and supporting those communities rather than treating them like sacrifice zones is really what needs to be done as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of curiosity about the ash and the burning. Um, Patricia says, what about, I think it's WTE, waste to energy, where plastic waste is burned to make steam to power an electric generator? So, a lot of so most plastic is actually ending up in landfills or the environment. But then another proportion, a smaller but growing portion, is incinerated. And even if it is used waste to energy, there is always going to be uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which we should not be creating more of because of the climate crisis. But also, plastic is the most toxic material to burn. So when we are burning it, sure there can be scrubbers. There's other you know equipment to try to capture some of this pollution but it doesn't capture everything. And the, around these incinerators and in the ash itself, so many toxic chemicals, um, many carcinogens like dioxin, PCBs, and um, PFAS, as I mentioned, and it just, you know, they have to be dumped somewhere. So it's like the ash exists, it's not going away. It's just kind of concentrated, um, no matter what, if it's waste energy or not. Um, and so, you know, for example, the community that I was living in, the Brookhaven landfill community as well, um, when it rains and if the landfill is not uh, lined properly, which most are not, um, all those toxins just go into the water. Also the ash very easily blows into the air and you're in inhaling particulate matter. So it's definitely not a good solution. Uh, landfills are not a good solution either. So again, like stopping it at the source is, is really key. So Cindy asked, and I think that a few other people have asked something similar, like let's say tomorrow I got rid of all the plastic in my house. What should I do with it? 
great question. There is not a good answer for this. And I really think like I've been an artist who has used plastic in my artwork. There are artists who want it. Um, I think we have to also accept we live in this imperfect system. And if you want to purge your house of plastic, that's it's encouraging because you don't want to expose yourself and your family. I actually personally, longer story, but I built a house in 2020, 2021. Um, and it's as plastic free as I could get it which was really hard, <laughs> um, but I, I tried. And um, I think, you know, to know though, at least what's happening and to going forward, not buy more plastic, um, that's a good step. And I think, you know, at least you know where it's going and it's not, not good, but um, you know, you can, you can put some plastic in your recycling. They say um, number one, four, and sometimes five, um, you know, sometimes gets recycled, but it's, we call it wish cycling when you're just putting stuff in your bin. So, um, you know, I'm often just put it in the trash right now, but yeah, I'm, so I wish I had a better answer. I feel almost guilty telling you to do this. Like, um, but, but I think, I think what you said is that it shouldn't be single use. So like, if you have plastic in your house, use it, use it, use it, use it, use it. Right. Just don't just throw it away. Um, I mean, unless you don't want to be exposed, I think that's very valid. Like with foodware, I would get rid of your plastic foodware. Don't ever put it in the microwave. Um, don't heat it up. Don't put liquids in it. Um, like the the slick of oil or grease that you see on plastic containers when there's something greasy in it is just like it's a mixture of uh, toxins reacting right there. So yeah, I would avoid that if you can. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people have asked: Is there any plastic that is better than other? Oh, I can't say that it's better. <laughs> oh, um, I would say like PVC is really toxic, like that you should try to avoid. And it's very hard because a lot of our water systems are made with PVC pipe um, and it, it's very cheap. It's very abundant, but it's also one of the most toxic, not only to our bodies, but to the people who are living near PVC factories. Um, and so if you are in a, you know, say you're in a house that has already has PVC pipes and you can't afford to rip them out, um, like at my mom's house here, use a filter, you know, use, I have, um, even in my own house, I have a reverse osmosis filter. It was $150, change the filter once a year, twice a year. Um, it's, it's helping to protect your health. It's not an answer, but it's like, you know, if you're not buying single use water bottles that are filled with microplastics and toxins. So it's a lot of trade-offs, but doing your homework helps. I know um, at plasticpollutioncoalition.org, we have blogs with like all this information. So we try to empower um, you to make the choices that are sometimes really confusing to make. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that recycling is, is a big question here too about, we were told, as you know, as everybody knows that recycle, 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 and people are recycling, but only a, a very small percent, percentage of it actually gets reused. Is that true? How much of that is actually reused? How, what, how is it reused? What should we focus on? Yeah. So it, again, it's a very, very small amount and um, really focusing on turning it off and, and refusing single use plastic of all kinds, because what is recycled is, like I said, turned into lower quality items or it's turned into items that will just put us at more risk of interacting with toxic plastic. So yeah, if we can eliminate it or just avoid it, um, and again, if we are putting in the recycling bin, it might just be shipped to another country and dumped in someone's backyard. I think having that consciousness about it where it's not just this magical bin that we can like get an excuse for using plastic. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and sometimes we can't avoid it. Like nobody's perfect. So don't feel that I'm trying to be like very hard on you by saying this, but I just to encourage you. And so you can make an informed choice. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to say for people that are here that I'm going to be talking about Eric to Eric about coming back again to answer a lot of these questions that we're not going to get to. So the last question that I'm going to ask you um, from Jennifer, which I think I also had in my mind is, how are those people in Diamond doing? Have they had any success with that ash pile? In Diamond or in uh, North? Was well, it the, with I'm the sorry. plastic factory? The plastic factory in Diamond, most residents of Diamond did get relocated elsewhere and they got money from Shell, which owned the Norco plant to to be moved. Um, but few residents do still live there. And, and think about it, it's very hard to leave your home. Like you don't necessarily want to leave where your whole family lived for generations and farmed and uh, grew up. So folks do still do live there. Um, many have left um, and live out of um, harm's way of that facility. But 
the threat remains and so many communities are still living on the fence line, as we call it. Right. And moving somebody from one place to another doesn't necessarily, I mean, there's other communities, like you said, that are having similar issues. We're all in the same boat at this point. Right. And as you know, industry builds up. I mean, just look in your own neighborhood. You might be in an environmental justice community. And and I mean, I didn't realize, but where I move, there's a huge recycling scrapyard super close by a transfer center. That's not great. And um, yeah, we just have to be informed, I think, to make these decisions. But yeah, I hope I left you feeling encouraged because I'm encouraged. <laughs> and I'm so glad so many of you joined. So thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you, Erica, for everything. Your uh, images are they, I guess we need to see them. So thank you. And everybody who came, I will send out the recording link and, um, and the, and the uh, resources that Erica shared. And I hope you all have a wonderful night and stop buying plastic. <laughs> thank you so much, Mina. Thanks all. Take care. Yep. Have a good night, everyone.